Good morning, Central, both of you, all of you who are online and those of you who are here with us this morning. We have some announcements this morning. I wanted to clarify a couple of things. The governor made a pronouncement yesterday, um, and there are folks who are worried that that applied to us. It does not apply to churches. So long as we keep our masks on and we keep socially distanced, we are good. So we are not shutting down uh, the church. In fact, something to keep in mind is that our... Uh, our COVID numbers in Radford are going down, um, and they have been. Um, there was a high a couple weeks ago of you know, 84 per thousand, and I think we're down to like 21. Um, but those, those are a couple days old. I don't get mine from the Virginia Health Department. I get them from the Harvard place. And so those, day, those numbers are a couple of days old when, by the time I get them. So I hope that we are continuing to go down. I watched an interview this week, and there was a doctor being interviewed and he was making his plea with a vaccine uh, a couple of months away uh, that we not give up uh, keeping our distance and keeping the masks on and keeping the hands washed and all that kind of stuff and he was you know doing that doctor thing and pounding away at all the stuff we had to do and then the interviewer um, did something interesting and she said if you could take your coat off your doctor's coat off for just a minute and tell us how you're doing and how you feel about all this and it was interesting because it was it was a great question because it gave him the chance not to just be the doctor but be the person who always has to remember to put the mask on always has to wash his hands always has to keep six feet away and and sit there and tell you how tired he is of it all but it's still going to keep with it. And after nine months, I can't believe that there's a single person who's going to get up tomorrow morning and say, oh boy, I get to put my mask on. Woo! Happy day. I, I'm not finding anybody doing that yet. And then I just sat there and listened to him as he talked about um, being in a doctor's office and letting his kids know that grandma and grandpa probably are not going to be with them for Thanksgiving dinner because... He can't take the risk, you know, working in a doctor's office, in his, in his own office and coming. You never know when you are going to come into contact with somebody. And he just, uh, it just tore him up um, to have to think about that kind of stuff. So sometimes you think that all the people unloading stuff at you aren't real people and they love what we're doing and don't, aren't bothered by it. And that's, that's simply not true. So... I would just ask you, since we are a couple months away from a vaccine, um, I can't visit you in the hospital and I don't want to. And I don't want to have to do anything more severe than that. So please, um, just be safe for a little bit longer. It's coming. It is coming. They've got working on the supply chain and how to get stuff to us. And I was listening to somebody yesterday and they said, the hardest decision is going to be whether you give it to the senior citizens first who are most vulnerable, or you give it to the young kids, not kids, kids, but college, you know, the 20-somethings, you could tell how old the person was, who run around and carry it everywhere and infect everybody. So, um, and if that's the toughest choice we're going to have to make in getting the vaccine out, I count us very, very, very lucky, okay? And then the question is going to be, how quick can you get 200 million doses uh, out there? And you know, at 20 million a month, you can you can do the math. That's that's pretty doggone easy, um, and that's assuming there are no glitches and there's no problems. Okay, not to say swine flu or Ebola to you, but uh, these rollouts don't always happen as as they're supposed to. So just keep the faith and keep doing what you're doing, and I would like to be with you all when this is over. And uh, I don't know if we're ever going to laugh about it, but I would like to be with you. And uh, so if you can be with me, we'll, we'll get there. So that is our, my first announcement. Um, handbells. If you have ever rung, if you would like to ring, and we missed you, handbells are going to meet Wednesday at 6.30. Where, where are the handbells meeting? In the fellowship hall. Okay, so I don't know where the finance committee meeting is going to be this week, but we'll... I'll leave breadcrumbs unless that's against the COVID regulations, so you can 
follow the breadcrumbs to wherever we're meeting. Um, that shouldn't be too long. That's at 6 o'clock. I just can't have them both happening in the same place right on top of each other. So um, if you haven't rung but you'd like to, there are plenty of folks who are going to be ringing who haven't rung and are learning. So you, you just fit right in. If you're in the choir and you miss doing the choir, um, give this a whirl because um, there you are. It's, it's what we're able to do for a while. Okay? So... Just, uh, you're more than welcome. Finance Committee is Wednesday at 6. All the other stuff is all there. Um, Bible studies are all in place. I believe, is this the week that the blood drive happens? Anybody know? No? Is that up there? Do, 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 do. Yes. All right, there we go, 20th. All right, those are all our announcements. Anything else I have forgotten or needs to be made for the good of the body? All right, in that case... Um, you're going to stand. Well, we, uh, I mean, you don't have to, but you'll be sitting for a long time. So why don't you stand up and we're going to do um, Onward Christian Soldiers. They told me. Wanted to start in between services. Uh, Kathy Hall is not here this morning. Um, she posted that she woke up this morning and she now has uh, uh, she has no brother. Her brother passed away in the night, so um, she is minus a sibling. So if you would remember Kathy this morning, this is probably a rough and difficult time for her. Um, also, Rose Rogers. I probably should I should have shared this last week because I think this is a week old. Return my phone call. She has uh, had her stint put in, and she is working her way back here eventually. She said she is coming back. Um, I assume not before the doctor lets her out and before she's ready to, ready to take that risk, but she said she's headed this way at some point. Um, Sarah Donnelly and family, uh, if you remember them, and uh, Matthew Hill burned his foot this week, so if you would remember Matthew, um, and Bo Bootsy and Butch Reed are having, both of them are having health problems. I ask that you remember them. And the family of Colonel Eugene Grayson, who passed away this week. He's uh, over in, his family is over in Snowville. So um, if you just remember them this morning, that would be fine. Shall we pray? Oh, yes, ma'am. David is having surgery. 
And you all need to, need to remember that. I am hoping and praying that David's surgery does everything that they say it is, it's going to do. So he's having that uh, do funky things to your back so it doesn't pinch stuff surgery. So um, there you go. So just be in prayer for David. Anything else that we've forgotten or failed to mention? Are we all set? All right, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Breathe on us, breath of God. May your spirit fill the recesses of our souls. May your spirit lift us and consecrate us in this hour that we might be the body of Christ gathered in this place and in this hour. Accept, we beseech you, our praise offered on your behalf. Let it be acceptable in your sight, O God. May your spirit make us one with you and one with each other as we go out into service of this world. We pray that your spirit might move across this nation, that there might be an awakening, awakening as unknown to previous generations. We pray that your spirit might renew, renew, and reawaken your children from one sea to the next. We remember this morning, O oh God, that you are our helper in time of need. And we ask this morning that you would be with Sarah Donnelly and her family, that you would be with David as he has and recovers from surgery. We pray that you would be with Matthew Hill, and Bootsy and Butch Reed, and the family of Eugene Grayson. We ask that you would have your hand upon them, that your spirit move with them, that you would restore them to health, and you might stay and abide with them. We pray for our church and our country. We pray for those affected by the pandemic who have lost loved ones, we ask, most gracious God, that you give us hope, that you give us patience, that you also give us an ounce of gratitude and an ease of manner. For these are trying times, and it is ever so difficult to stand in judgment and heckle and berate it is so much more difficult to find the good in those persons and circumstances around us. May we be purveyors of love and grace. May we give as much as we have received through your hand and through your Son. Amen. As Donna plays our offertory this morning, I would invite you to stop and think about all the things that you are thankful for this week. There are so many things that uh, weigh us down and get between us and around us and in our way, but I just ask this morning that you would just take a couple moments and think about the things that lift us up.
I know your Methodists can't get an amen anyway. Amen. All right, I hope you are thankful. If you would uh, like to stand, since you've been sitting a while, and we are going to do uh, Lead On, O King Eternal. Deborah, I'm going to give you fair warning. I have, uh, you just follow me as best you can. I'm going off a little, well, I'm, I'm not sure how off script I'm going to be, but it'll be off script, okay? Um, you all wonder why I write everything down, why I read it, and that's so that Deborah and I can stay synced up. But every once in a while, um, you go through a sermon and you think, you know, we could be doing... If you move this and you move that and you push this over here and you do that over there, it would come out an awful lot better. Well, that's fine, except we don't have time to change all the slides for the second service, you see. So, Deborah's just, you just do the best you can. And um, there's only one slide I really want to get to. Um, and I'll let you know when we get there. So, our scripture lesson comes from Judges, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 7. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now that Ehud was dead, that left-handed trickster, how dare he be left-handed? You wouldn't know that unless you read the story, but trust me, he's left-handed, and, and that's not a good thing. So the Lord sold them, the Israelites, into the hands of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reign, reigned in Hazor. And Caesarea, the commander of his army, was based in Herosheth Hagayim because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Caesarea, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and give them into your hands. And there ends the lectionary reading. We'll get back to that. The story goes on for two chapters, but like I say, we'll come back to that in just a minute. I had just started following baseball. I hadn't for years and years. And for some reason, when I moved down here, the Nationals just kind of drew me in some 18 years ago. By the time I was following them with any regularity, this young kid um, was signed to play with them at 17. And perhaps he was the youngest ever at that time. He appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And the world was his. No one, no one could hit the ball like Bryce Harper. 
forgetting that he was just a teenager because I don't believe he's even turned 30 yet after all the years he's been playing, forgetting that he was just a teenager, people either loved him or hated him. We went to see him in Atlanta at the new baseball stadium before he was traded to that other team whose name we don't mention, but must beat every year in the playoffs. And Bryce Harper came out, and I will tell you that everybody in Atlanta started booing. I mean, you could hear them, I think, for miles around, boo, when Bryce Harper came up because they had this little uh, tomahawk. It's not little. It just looks little when you're in the nosebleed seats. Um, it's set behind home plate, and when Bryce Harper came up to bat, he took his bat, and he just kind of dragged it across the tomahawk. That would be like for the rest of us sitting in an American flag down there behind home plate and somebody just kind of dragging their bat across that American flag. Same kind of thing. If you're a Braves fan, you don't go for that, you don't do that. And Bryce Harper, given his age, was forever jerking somebody's chain. And when he jerked the chain of all the Atlanta fans, you knew it. Oh, my goodness. They hated him with a passion, booed him to no end. And I'm telling you, the rest of the city heard and joined in, all of them. Problem was, Bryce was, was really, really good. And when you're really, really good and you can hit most of the balls on most days, something begins to happen to you. The opposing pitchers begin to decide that perhaps you are not the one that they want to pitch to. Perhaps it's the next guy. Perhaps if they pitch to you and you hit a grand slam or a home run or something, then they're on the board. So what happens is they pitch out or pitch around you or walk you, whatever term you want to use. Whatever happens, you don't get to hit the ball and you get walked. And if you're a young kid and you've been signed up to play baseball and everybody's telling you you're the best thing to come down the, the pike since sliced bread, you want to hit. But you don't get to hit. And they walk you. And then there's this other thing that happens to the person after you. Bryce traditionally was in the cleanup spot, which is number four, which is there because you get three people on base, and then you get the fourth one up, who's your, usually your best hitter, and they can clean the bases and bring them all in, okay, or bring most of them in, however that works. But that's the thinking anyway. It doesn't happen very often, but that's, that's the thinking. And over the years, I suspect that there were any number of people who batted fifth in the Nationals lineup after Bryce Harper. A lot of folks who batted fifth. But they were always after Bryce Harper. And I'm not sure what that does to your psyche when the pitcher walks Bryce Harper so that they can get to you. Because you're the easy out. You're the one we can get out not going to get Bryce Harper out. And if it was the same person for any length of time, I suspect that there would be some complex that would develop about your hitting ability and whether you're any good as a baseball player. So for the people who followed Bryce and Bryce, there was an attitude problem that was developing. Till one day, this guy named Dusty Baker managed the Nationals managed him for two years. And Dusty picked up on the problem with Bryce and the guys who were batting after Bryce, the people who were in the fourth and fifth um, position on the roster. And one day, Dusty had a meeting with those folks and sat him down and said, let me tell you a story. And it was a story about Hank Aaron. Now, I'm just here to tell you that there wasn't probably a single person in that dugout who didn't know who Hank Aaron was, could recite his record and tell you everything about Hank Aaron. Didn't have to tell much of a story about Hank Aaron. Hank Aaron was one of the best bats in the game and had the batting record until Barry Bonds broke it. And you guessed it. Here's your trivia for the day. He was playing against the Nationals and broke Barry Bonds' record at our ballpark. So there you go. There is your trivia for the day. Use it if you can. Otherwise, you will forget it. And Dusty said the problem was that Hank Aaron was not unique. 
Anybody who is good, as good as Hank Aaron would be batted around or would be pitched around, would be walked because you didn't want to take the risk, especially in a close game. And all of a sudden, the story that Dusty told changed because he wanted to talk to them about the batter who came after Hank Aaron every game for years. And how batting after Hank Aaron was not good for that young man's self-esteem. And his self-esteem began to take a nosedive, knowing that every pitcher would rather pitch to him because he was an easier out. Now, I don't know how many people here know who it was that batted after Dusty Baker when he played for the Braves. Anybody know? If I got any real baseball in the... What was that? You can't answer because you were at the early service. Yeah. Dusty Baker. Dusty Baker was the man who batted after Hank Aaron. And most people don't remember Dusty's playing career. They remember his managing career, especially after this year. And Dusty Baker said it was hard. It was hard batting fifth. And he said, at some juncture, I just had to get my mind and wrap myself around it that it wasn't personal. That I wasn't Hank Aaron, I was never going to be Hank Aaron, but that didn't mean I wasn't a good ball player. Kicker is, everybody knew who Hank Aaron was and nobody knew who Dusty Baker was. And that's kind of how it was. And to tell you the truth, I can't remember a single person, specifically, who batted after Bryce Harper. And there you go. And the interesting thing about today's story is I can't tell you offhand without looking it up who's in the story besides Deborah. It's interesting. We were having staff meeting and the perennial question at staff meeting is, so what are you preaching on this week? So they can sort of get the early service music lined up with it and maybe think about talking to the kids in Sunday school. Although they talked about this last week, so they weren't going to talk about it this week. And then that gets Wendy up and ready for church tonight at 5 o'clock if you want to drive in. Assuming we don't blow away, um, church will be here at 5 o'clock for the kids and the youth and anybody else who uh, wants to motor in. And uh, I was asked, so who is the general that wouldn't fight without Deborah? And I couldn't remember. I had to, had to look it up. And I was writing the sermon. And the gentleman's name was Barak. I don't have any... <clears throat> yeah, I do. Were you in Sunday school last week or no? Yeah. All right. Do you know the guy's name? Do you know the guy's name? It was Barak. And you remember how Cesara dies? How he gets it in the end? How does he die? This woman whose name is Jael comes up and what does she do? Yeah, yeah. Takes that tent stake and barrels it right into his forehead. And that's the end of Cesara. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And it's, it's funny because I had to, you know, it, there are tough stories. And the stories in Judges, you don't let your kids read Judges unsupervised. You generally don't let your kids read the Old Testament unsupervised. It's not a pretty place, okay? It's just, just not a pretty place. So <clears throat> that is the whole story. And all I remember is the name Deborah. That's all I remember. And the fact that she was a judge of Israel. And she sent out a word. And the word was to Barak, saying, Take 10,000 men, go over here, and God will deliver Caesarea's army to you. And Barak says, No way! I'm not going. I am not going. And then you begin to see this pattern that emerges in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is a book that starts up here and winds up on a decline. You know, in most movies, everything rises to a climax. Everything sort of devolves. And you start with these judges. And we mentioned Ehud 
First of all, Ehud was a trickster and he was left-handed. Now, I'm not going to ask how many lefties I've got here. But when I was in school, you were punished for being a left-hander. They didn't make scissors for you. Tough it out, baby. They made you write with your right hand. Don't you be using that left hand. You use that left hand, the devil must inhabit your left hand. I don't know what the problem was. As a kid, I never understood why everybody had to write with their right hand. What difference did it make? But it made some difference. And that prejudice against left-handers goes way, way back. Way, way back. And then the other judge that happens before Deborah... is Shamgar, and given his name, we're not even sure if he's an Israelite. So you have a foreigner, a foreigner as a judge of Israel. And then you get to Deborah, and she's a woman. Now, I'm sorry, ladies, you come a long way, baby. But it hadn't happened yet in the Old Testament. And she just looked at Barak and said, I don't know if you figured this out yet there, guy, but male generals don't take female judges into battle with them. It doesn't look good. And there's this kind of descending slope until you get to Samson at the end of the book, who's a total moral degenerate. And I share that with you because the story is not about the judges. It is not about the judges. Every story in the book of Judges begins exactly the same way. It starts with the statement, Israelite did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Do you remember back when you made the covenant in the book of Deuteronomy? When the holy people of God sat at Mount Sinai and they promised some things? After they promised some things, there were a list of blessings if they followed it, and a list of curses if they didn't. And what happens when you stop following God is the curses ensue. And the Israelites do evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they are sold into slavery. I want you to stop and think about that. You are the children of God. You are the children of God, and your father sells you into slavery. How bad are you acting? I know plenty of parents who have thought about selling their children into slavery. I don't know a single one who did. Instead, they opted for nap time. So we could all take a break and come back around at it again. So my question is, how bad does it have to be when your own father... Is going to sell you into bondage and slavery. And the writer of Judges uses that terminology deliberately. And I want to ask you, where else was Israel held in bondage and slavery? Where had they just come from and been there for 500 years? What is the author trying to trigger in your memory? The other thing the author tells you and that isn't the same, this is different for this story, but he says, Caesarea harassed them with iron chariots. Okay, we're not quite to the Iron Age, but we're getting there. And the chariots are made of iron. Now, chariots are not Sherman tanks. You don't put them out, they're not cavalry, you don't stick them in the front. But what chariots can do is when you've got the enemy on the run, They're fast, and you put the archers in the back, and you put the driver in the front, and the archer sits on the back. I don't know how he stays on the back, but that's not my problem. I don't have to do it. And he takes out his bow and arrow, and he shoots all the people who are trying to escape. And works good in an ambush. Who else had chariots? Anybody remember a story where there are all of these chariots that are pursuing the children of Israel. Anybody remember a story like that? It kind of stopped on the shores of the Red Sea. And finally, the author says, the Israelites cried out to God for help. Who else do you know who 
who cry out to God for help. Who was it? Well, you know the answer to all of those things. It is the children of Israel who are kept in bondage in Egypt. They are slaves in Egypt. They are pursued by the chariots of the Egyptians. They are hunted down by the Egyptians. And God says, stop! I will claim you as my own. You are my children, and I will buy you back. Oh, I will buy you back. You want to help me out, Hunter? Do you remember a couple weeks ago we talked about Abraham and his nephew Lot? You remember that? Maybe, maybe not. I hope so. And Lot was his nephew, and Lot went off after they got into the promised land, and Lot was captured captured by some kings and held, held for ransom. Do you remember why Abraham saves Lot? That's a tough question, especially from two weeks ago. Man, that's a tough question. Anybody here know why Abraham rescued Lot? Oh, come on, my Bible study folks, you remember. Why is that, Jackie? He was his kinsman, his redeemer. He was his goel. He was family. When all the chips are down, when everything is against you, assuming your family is not totally dysfunctional, and sometimes even if it is, your family is there. Your family is there for you and will come get you when you are in trouble. When you have wound up into Huskow, right? When the state police come pick you up, and throw you in for drunk driving. Who's going to come bail you out? You get behind on your taxes, who's going to write a check? You get into all kinds of trouble. Who is bailing you out? Your family bails you out. Your family bails you out. They come get you. What the author of Judges wants you to understand is that God operates the same way every single time. He operates the same in the book of Judges as he did in the, in the Exodus story. And when the people of God turn away, right? When we turn away, who is it that buys us back? It's not necessarily the God of Israel. That's not what we do, is it? We know who our Redeemer is, right? Right? We know who our next of kin is. We know who our brother is. We know who paid the price so that we did not have to, right? And we just sort of bandy that word redeemer around like it doesn't mean anything. What it means is that your father and your brother have bought you out. They have paid the price. How does redemption come? That's the slide I want. All right, how does redemption come? What you learn in the book of Judges, what you learn from this story, is that God's redemption comes when his people cry out. When they have paid their penalty, when they understand that what they have done is wrong, that they have hurt themselves, they have hurt the people around them, and there is no way out, God answers them and says, I am your way out. I will come get you. I will pay the price. I will redeem you. And God will use any means necessary. That's a message that is unique to the book of Judges. Most of these judges are not people you want as your neighbors. Okay, they're not. And you definitely don't want Samson living next door to you. The party life is like way too high on the Richter scale. God will use whatever means is necessary to deliver you. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. I'm not sure what it says. But if I get in trouble... And Bozo the Clown is the only avenue around me, the only person who can come get me and bail me out that God would send Bozo the Clown. 
I'm not sure what that says. Maybe it says, I'm too valuable to lose. Maybe you're too valuable to lose. And God will use whatever is at hand to bring you back. And finally, it is grace. It always comes by grace. The children of Israel did not earn back their place with God. They repented and God graciously brought them back. No matter what happens, no matter what happens, the king will come. And the king will redeem you at any price, by any means necessary. You are just that valuable. You are his children. You are worth it all. You are the redeemed of the Lamb. Bought back is such a price that no character in the Bible would have ever known or guessed. You are God's chosen people who have been redeemed. Would you pray with me? Most gracious and loving God, we come before you this morning. And we've made a couple of mistakes here and there somewhere along the way. But you have been there to redeem us. You are our next of kin. You are our father, you are our brother, and you are willing to pay the price and buy us back. We give you thanks, O God, that you have always been in the business of buying your people back. We give you thanks, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I would like you to stand and receive the benediction this morning, please. As the ushers come to get you and take you out, I'm going to send you forth this morning. I send you forth as the redeemed of God, brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, children of the Heavenly Father having a value that is inestimable, that was worth the sacrifice paid on Calvary. You are the redeemed. You are God's chosen and his family. Go and be redeemed. Amen. takes a spark to get a fire going, and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God. to sing it.
It's fresh like spring. You want to pass it on.